Amen. It's okay. I love hearing the baby. Good morning, church. Good to see you. If you have your Bibles, turn to 1 Corinthians, please. If you have a Bible, it's good to have that Bible app. There are Bibles by the pillars back there. There are some. Open up. We've been talking as Paul visits a church. He founded a church in Corinth, a port city. He lived there as his pastor for about 18 months. And when he was there, did, I'm sure, a lot of great work, shared the gospel. Once he left, however, they still had questions and issues that kept arising. And there was one Jewish Christian named Apollos, who was a good guy, knew his Bible well. We learned that from Acts. And he came and talked. Well, after a while, what happened was the Corinthian congregation is they started and letting their Corinthian values, you might say pagan, non-Christian, non-Jewish values, influence the way they understood the church and how we're supposed to treat each other. And Paul addresses a whole lot of those problems, and it caused a lot of dissension. So different house churches, house churches are probably against each other, house churches, and I follow Apollos, I follow Paul, I follow, and then they were, not only were they were divided, which was really, really sick and bad for a church to be divided following human teachers, and they started choosing sides. Moreover, they started choosing sides thinking that you choose sides based on the wisdom that they provide, and so you started kind of chasing after earthly wisdom. Now, why would they do that? Because the Corinthians, they, they loved that. They valued it. Celebrities were the great rhetoricians and orators. They, they were known in all of Greece. They were one of the most well-known places to be the prized rhetoricians of their day. Paul had struggled with that because he's trying to help them say, stop doing that. Well, when Paul wrote his letter, he didn't write in verses and chapters. He just he wrote in arguments, and you might say. But today we're going to finish up, chapter. we're going to do chapter 4, which for us is four whole chapters, which is a lot where the Apostle Paul, right at the beginning of his letter to the Corinthians, says, we have got to get this figured out. You have got to come together. And after he talks about that for a long time, then he moves on to other behaviors in the church. But at first part, he's going to wrap up this argument of we've got to stop choosing sides. So if you have your Bible, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, we're going to start on verse 1. And if you have it, would you say amen? Amen. Good. Be sure to look at it. If you can, the Bible is a chief authority for faith and practice. If you haven't found it yet, look at your table of contents, you can find it. Paul says, this is how one, he means the Corinthians, this is how you should think about us. Us meaning Paul and Apollos, these Jewish teachers, the Christian teachers. You should think of us as servants of Christ. And that's the good translation there, servant. You should think of us like Jesus' waiters or waitresses and stewards of the mysteries of God. And steward means a household manager, usually was a head slave, the slave in charge, who was left in charge of the master's household. He's saying, hmm, when you think about me and Apollos, don't think we're rival groups like you do the Corinthian values. No, no, no. Think of us as Christ's servants and stewards over the mysteries of God. He means the gospel. Our job is to take care of that, verse 2. Moreover, it's required of a steward that they be found trustworthy. That's right. So if you had a job description of a steward in the ancient world, at the top of the list would say trustworthy. Why? Because you're, the master's leaving to the care of this head slave all of his belongings. He could be a thief, a liar. He could murder people. He could just burn the house down. They've got to be trustworthy. Paul says that's what matters the most in us too. Verse 3. Now, why would he say such a thing? Because there are criticizing Paul. They're judging in verse 3. But with me, it's a very small thing that I should be judged by your in court. Well, the implication is that's what they're doing. So that means there are people in Corinth and the church who have already written off their founding pastor. He doesn't know what he's talking about. In that sense, judge them. They've written him off. He says, that's a little thing. I don't even judge myself. I'm not in the judging business in that sense. Verse 4, I'm not aware of anything against myself But I'm not, therefore, your translation might say, acquitted or declared innocent, declared righteous. I can't think of anything, but that doesn't mean I'm innocent. But I can't. I mean, have a look at my own self. Why? It is who judges me. Say it. The Lord judges me. That's why I don't worry about who judges me, because the Lord's going to do that. Verse 5, he says, therefore, basically, don't pronounce judgment. Don't write off people before the time. He means judgment day. He says, before the Lord comes. Who will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness, and he will disclose the purposes of the heart. Then every man will receive his commendation or or his praise from God. So Paul's point here is, first is defense, which is say, listen, church at Corinth, ultimately I don't report to you. I don't answer to you. I'm not your steward. 
I'm not your slave in charge. Which means ultimately, I don't seek your approval. I'm, I'm just not your servant. I'm not your slave. It's like what Jesus said in Luke 12 about his disciples, all disciples of Jesus. Jesus gives a parable. Jesus said, the Lord replied, who then is the faithful and wise manager? You could say steward. It's the same Greek word. Who is that faithful and wise manager or steward? The master puts in charge of his household servants to give them their allowance of food at the proper time. Blessed is that slave whom his master finds at work when he returns. I tell you the truth, the master will put him in charge of all his possessions. Now imagine that head slave going, I can't make my decision. I'm the head slave. Why? Because the slaves are talking about me behind my back. I got to do it. They're judging me. They don't like me as a slave. And if they were to think for one second that that steward thinks he or she is reporting to fellow slaves, you're completely wrong. Now, in the picture, you see a slave. This is a Roman, this is a graffiti on the side of a wall. And around the same time that Paul wrote the letter in Roman, this is a picture of a slave who's carrying oatmeal cream pies. I'm kidding. Bread, um, God's favorite. Bread. Now, imagine the slave for a second. He's walking around with the bread in this picture. And he said, this is my bread, bread, son. You want some of my bread? This is my bread. I made this my bread. No slave in the right mind would ever say such a dumb thing. Nothing is the slave's. This isn't my bread. But you know what the slaves are talking? Do you know what they're saying behind your back? It's not their bread. They say you don't give it to the right people. And that's Paul's like, at the first point. I just don't report to you. Now, this is one of the most challenging aspects of being a person who preaches. It is. And, and for missionaries, too, and so forth. And it's the struggle. Because ultimately, Paul's saying, every single minister, we don't report to you. Let me say it this way. At Judgment Day, they will not, Paul will not be standing before the first church at Corinth. Yes, Corinthian church, tell me how the ways I failed or what I did great. He says, your commendation, your praise. He won't. I will not stand before the Lord God at, at Hill Church's throne. It won't happen. Now, you might disagree with this, and that's up to you, I guess, but in Christianity, I, I firmly believe very, very much in Judgment Day. I do believe that very much I'm going to die. I believe at death that God will very much hold me accountable to what I said and did. I very much believe that. And praise God, I will cling as hard as I can, metaphorically, to the cross, to Jesus. I will. And I'm not exactly sure what it's going to look like, but come that Judgment Day, I guarantee I won't be reporting to you. You might think otherwise. We tend to think otherwise when we're living in the real world, as it were, we, but I'm just not going to. That's the struggle with this. When I chose 1 Corinthians to be the sermon series, I started getting nervous just when I chose it because I know what's going to come up next. Paul's going to set this whole thing up to say, you can't be divided on, on which man you're following and wisdom and wisdom. You've got to unite together behind Jesus. And while we're at it, here's several more chapters of how you're supposed to behave. And it, almost everything Paul says in this letter is unpopular today. Well, that's tough. Why? Because people like David need a paycheck. And so we're always in this constant dividing line between, well, I'm not your employee, but yeah, I am, and not really. Missionaries have to make this decision all the time. If I don't preach or teach what I think my conscience says, I could lose my job. And the exact same thing is true with any Christian. We think this all the time. David, if I read my book at work, they would, what would they think about me? Wh whose approval are you seeking? If I'm at home and I talk about Jesus, they're going to cut me off. Whose approval are you seeking? Well, I'm approving, you know, Jesus, absolutely. But, I mean, really, though? Whose approval are you seeking? It reminds me in the book of Acts, Acts 5, when Peter and John, they're, come, they're dragged before the Sanhedrin, the Sanhedrin, the big Supreme Court of the Jews, and they say, you've got to stop preaching about Jesus. And, man, you, you got to do you, man. You do, I'm paraphrasing, but it's like this. You got to do what you got to do, brother, because we have to, to please God rather than, you know what your Bible says? Rather than man or humans. We, gotta, we choose God, not humans. You do what you do, but we will not stop. Why is that? Because I'm not seeking your approval. I don't report to you. I just don't. Does that mean Paul doesn't love the church? Of course he does. He says in another place, he says, I have the daily burden of the worry, daily of my churches. He loves the churches. He just has a firm grasp that if he doesn't teach what he thinks is true, what he thinks is true based on the teaching of Jesus, he's going to be held accountable to that. And he says, I just don't, you can judge me all you want. Write all the complaints you want. We can have all the meetings and how it didn't go the way you like. Go for it. Go for it. I know, let's complain all day long. But at the end of the day, I just don't report to your complaining card. I'll be held before the throne himself. 
And that's exactly like any Christian in any workplace or at home. You and I decide all the time whose approval are we seeking. And when we're really, really seeking the outside approval, we will make concession after concession after concession. We'll start talking like them and sounding like them and not doing this and not doing this. We know we ought to do this, but we don't do it. Why? Because deep down, we're really just seeking their approval. We want them, we want they to be so excited that we're part of their club. And we get, at some point, I have to say, whose approval am I seeking? Moreover, what Paul says here, not only do I not care about your judging me, church at Corinth, church at Hill, man, you do you. I don't even judge myself. Now, if I look at my own life, Paul says, I just examine myself. Am, is, am I caught in some sin right now? He says, I don't think so. But I can't trust those feelings. We cannot trust our feelings or our intuition to tell us whether we're innocent or guilty. This is one of the greatest struggles I find when I talk about ethics to a person, especially if they're non-Christian. But this is true for Christians too. I don't feel bad when I do it. I don't feel convicted. I don't feel like it's the wrong thing to do. And that, I mean, it's every single Disney song, every single country song, right? Let your heart be your guide. And the Christian worldview, all through Scripture, the view is that we can be self-deceived. We can be self-deluded. That is 1 John 1, 8. If you say you have not sinned, I mean, he says you're on crack. I mean, it's in the Greek. But he says, listen, God will declare your praise and blame. God will. We cannot trust. It feels good. It feels right. And that will come right up in our face. If you come back to church and starting next week and the next, the next few sermons, when I go right back to what Paul says about sexual ethics, it's going to be very unpopular. It's going to be right up in our grill. And Paul knows what he's talking about when he starts out by saying, you cannot follow the feeling. You can't say, but it feels good. I mean, I look at my life, I go, I fit in. No one's condemning me. I don't feel guilty. Paul says you can't trust that. You, you can't trust your intuition more than you trust the teachings of Jesus. We have to go back to that all the time. And if we're being honest about this, if we really saw that as authoritative, you and I would be devouring our scripture all the time. But the fact is we don't. I mean, just be honest. Well, David, it's tough to have that habit. It is. I'm a human too. Does that mean you can't fail? Yes, you can. I'm just saying, but if we had thought it was authoritative, we'd go back to it all the time. I've asked people before, can you list 10 things Jesus taught? And you're sure, like in a court of law, you'd go to the electric chair if you're wrong. 10 things Jesus taught. I've asked through the, uh, multiple churches through the years. Very few people ever, ever raised their hand. Five things, four things, three things. When I was a Boy Scout for three years, I love Scouts. Imagine I'm going out to scout camp for a whole week, and I'm out there, and I'm doing random stuff with the ropes. I go, what are you doing, David? Well, I'm just tying this. Why are you? We had a book, man. Well, no one taught me. There's a book right there, dude. It's called the Boy Scout Manual. Have you read it before? Yeah, but I, don't, I feel differently. When I tie this way, it feels good to me. Well, you can, but you know there are people who have been tying knots for centuries? You no. Know, I mean, I believe in that book, but not really. I mean, it's by analogy, I know it's not exactly the same. And Paul says, you can't trust your gut. You just can't. And that's, we'll see this in the document. Paul doesn't say, here's what I feel. Here's what I, there's one time we'll see that he'll say, this is not from the Lord, from myself. And he'll tell you what it is. But in general, Paul goes back to the teaching of Jesus to say, that's what the church should be doing today. And we cannot say, it just feels right. We'll be deluded. We can be deluded. We can be right. We can, it feels good and it's good. But can also be wrong. We don't trust our gut. We trust Jesus more. Verse 6, he says, I've applied all these things I'm saying right now, I just told you, Corinthians, to myself and to Apollos for your benefit. I'm diminishing how much I want you to praise us. It's for your good, Corinthians, for Hill Church, brethren, that you may learn by us not to go beyond what is written. Now, we don't know what written he means. Does he mean Old Testament verses he just quoted, maybe, about in chapter 2 and 3? Chapters 2 and 3 meaning don't boast, maybe. He could mean what's written, meaning what he just wrote. Don't go past what I just wrote, which is you've got to, don't focus on us. I, right, I planted, he watered, but God gave the growth, whatever. That none of you may be puffed up in favor of one against another. I don't want you to be puffed up. I don't want you to cause factions in the church. Verse 7, for who sees anything different in you? What have you that you did not receive? Well, if you've received it, why do you boast as if it were not a gift? It reminds me of people when I was a kid, boys used to brag about being tall. Yeah, I'm taller than you. And they're five foot ten. Like, why are you bragging, son? You had nothing to do with that. Yeah, but you're still short. I mean, it's just, just to brag. I had a but one of my best friends said, oh, Jason. He said, oh, what are you bragging about? 
it's a silly thing because it's not accomplishment on your part. Paul said, exactly. Right. That's exactly right. You're so proud. Oh, I'm so, look at the wisdom I've found. Look at me. And that's what calls the factions nonsense. That wisdom didn't come from you, but came from the Holy Spirit. It's just a gift. You can't boast about gifts. It's just a gift. Verse 8. Verse 8 is a little sarcastic. He gets a little, um, he's a little on their face right now. Verse 8. Already you're filled. He means like filled with knowledge. You're filled up. You're puffed up. Already you've become rich. Without us, you become kings. Now, that's what ancient philosophers actually said. If you followed their wisdom and you took life the way they said to live it, you'd live like kings. You would live like you're rich. And they, they probably were quoting this. We've already arrived. Some of them were. Paul says, and would that you did reign like that? I might share the rule with you. For I think that God has exhibited us as apostles last of all, like men sentenced to death. Because we've become a spectator of the world, to angels and to men. We're a laughing stock. In Greek, it says, we're morons. We're fools for Christ's sake. But you're wise in Christ. Good for you. We're weak. But you are strong. You're held in honor. But we in dishonor, or disrepute, it's dishonor. Verse 11. In fact, to this present hour, this very minute, we hunger, we thirst, we have barely have any clothes, clothes on us. We're attacked and we're homeless. And verse 12, we work like a slave. We labor working with our hands. Rich people did not work with their hands ever, ever, ever. In the ancient world, slaves served them. We work with our hands. When reviled, we bless. When persecuted, we endure. When slander, we encourage we have become and are now the refuse of the world. You might say the scum of everything. Like you Star Wars fans, uh, when he says you rebel, rebel scum. So good for you. Y'all have made it. You have arrived. You're all awesome. I wish I could be like you. We're not like you. In fact, we're much lower than you. Now, Paul expresses this kind of situation in other parts of his letters. He talks about what he went through. For example, he sells the same congregation. Now, by the time he writes this letter, they write back, there's more division. And they're saying, Paul's really not an apostle. And he has to argue that he is an apostle. He says, are they servants of Christ? I'm even more so. Listen to this. I'll read it on the screen. With much, I mean, not just in your mind. With much greater labors, with far more imprisonments, plural, with far more uh, severe beatings, facing death many times, Five times I received from the Jews 40 lashes less one. That's basically what Paul did before he became a Christian. He would drag in fellow Jews to the synagogue to whip them because they were saying bad theology. He's saying, that's what happened to me five times. Then he was beat with a rod three times. Uh, once I received a stoning. Three times I suffered shipwreck. A night and day I spent adrift in the open sea. How scary must that have been? I've been on journeys many times and dangers from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from my own countrymen, he means Jews, and dangers from Gentiles, dangers in the city, dangers in the wilderness, dangers at sea, dangers from false brothers, fellow people, they call themselves Christians, and hard work and toil, he means making tents all the time, through many sleepless nights and hunger and thirst, many times without food, and cold and without enough clothing. Whew. Sign me up, Paul. Make every day a Friday. Paul almost certainly is evoking what we would call the triumphant. People would come into town, and they'd bring in the biggest, best, most honorable people up front, the emperor or maybe a, a, a general at the time, but certainly the emperor's coming to town. They come into Rome, have a massive processional. It's a little bit smaller than hog days. I'm kidding. A lot, lot bigger. I imagine the biggest, biggest throne would come into town. And Paul says, who's the people way in the back at the end of that? Well, first, before you get there, you have all the stuff they stole. And right, at, you can go to the Titus Arch, which today in Rome, you can go there and drive your car into there. And they have inscribed on it pictures of the Roman soldiers taking the belongings from the Jewish temple that they sacked in AD 70. It still survived today. So they would be proud. They have the Roman soldiers. They have their, all the artifacts. They've stolen wherever they got it. And at the very last of the parade were the slaves, the people they beat in war. 
And so this image shows a recreate, uh, recreation of that where the Romans got their palm branches and they're going, woo, here they come. Paul says, I wish I were like you, way up in the front of the line, quote, unquote. We're like the ones in the back. And Richard Hayes, a New Testament scholar, I think said it perfectly. He said, if you really want to belong to Christ, Paul says, look at me. This is where it leads. This is what it looks like. Now, this is a powerful word for the church in our time. To belong to Christ is not a way of assuring success or trouble-free life. Quite the opposite. Paul had a successful life before he was called by God to his apostolic vocation. To become a proclaimer of Christ crucified meant giving all that up. The image of the suffering apostle should be held clearly before our eyes. And then we should ask ourselves, are we sure we want to belong to Christ and share his ways? Every Christian doesn't experience what Paul did. Of course not. But this is absolutely is the way of Jesus Christ for most people and for many people. Are you sure you want this? Now, Paul's going to say more in just a second. He wants to set an example. While you're all puffed up and so proud of who you are and all the divisions, I'm over here. I'm over here. To this very second, I don't have enough food in my stomach or a drink, and you sure are proud of yourself. Moreover, not only do I not have enough and I'm homeless, I'm still praising God as it were. I don't have any, I don't have junk. People are attacking me. And what do I do in response? Do I get my knife out, get my shiv out, and get them? Do I tear them down? Do I gossip? And these letters, do I say, you need to talk to so-and-so. He's the son of a gun. And blah, blah, blah. That's not at all what I do. No, when, in fact, when they curse me, I bless them. Verse 12, when they persecute me, I endure. In fact, when they slander me, I try to encourage them. That's what I try to do. That makes me look like a horrible moron to the world. And where does he get that from? Because, because Paul just felt good. It just felt, it just feels right. No, he got that from Jesus. Jesus says explicitly in Luke chapter 6, Jesus said, but I say to you who are listening, love your what? Enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. That's what Paul just said he does. Pray for those who mistreat you. Can you imagine how many road rage accidents would never have happened if we prayed for people who cursed us? I mean, many people would still have a job. What would it look like for real for the church across the globe, no matter the denomination, if disciples of Jesus really did this? If we never bucked up every time to defend our honor and our pride and our ego, if every single time we say, you know what, I'm not treating you the way you deserve to be treated. I'm not going to have a response to you because that's what you deserve. I'm going to treat you as I have been treated by the Lord Jesus. Paul says this exact same in Romans 12. He quotes it, bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. It's the very thing Christians can't. David, that sounds like a crazy per. I know, Paul said the same thing. It makes us look like morons to the world. We look so foolish. You look like a whip dog who's going to just take it and take it. Now, that's not what Paul means, nor did Jesus. Go back and listen to my sermon on the Sermon on the Mount. You look like a bunch of morons. Why would you take that? What do you do when someone attacks you? What do you do when someone talks about you? What do you do in the real world? Have you, raise your hand. Have you ever been talked badly about by someone? Have you been attacked before? Yeah, one of us? Yeah. It, it's awesome, isn't it, Stephanie? No, it's not at all. What do you do? It's worth thinking about. And all of us, if we're real gut level honest, we may never have said it this way. We may never have thought of it this way, but we do think this, and that is our response to the person who did something mean, deep down we think, it's okay that I said this or did this in response because, and so if we paid them back for what they were due, it's okay. Why? Because they deserved it, and they don't know who they're talking to, son. We've got, we've got some justification. It's okay to do this. What if we flipped that on its head and did exactly as Jesus commanded and as Paul is demonstrating here and said, yeah, I forgave them instead of holding a grudge. I did that and it's okay because why? Jesus forgave me. What are you smoking? Why would you ever forgive them? David, that's the real world. No, that's not the real world actually. Did you know that? It's okay to love them instead of hate them because why? That's the right thing to do. It's okay to act gracious to them instead of like a punk to them because why? That's exactly what Jesus done to me. He could have acted like a punk toward me. I, did, I deserve that. He didn't. He gave me grace. 
Paul says, that's exactly what we do. I live this all the time. What do you do in the real world? I mean, the real world. Someone cuts you off. Someone snaps at you. My son, the last year or so, has been working at different fast food restaurants. He gets a lot of practice with people being very, very mean to him. And that's, I know the real world, right? A lot of go to the jobs. We experience that stuff. So we role play. What are you saying? In front? Well, what do you do when they're coming at you so meanly and so hatefully? Because at some point, some core at a level, deep down, we're even saying, I want to trust my feeling, which tells me to get even because it's not right. Or we're going to trust Jesus in his way that says, don't do that. Don't do that. You bless those who curse you. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, your way is wrong. You trust that or trust me. You trust your gut or you trust me. And then Paul says, he gives some examples here in verse 14, he says, I don't write this to make you ashamed, Corinthians or Hill Church. I'm not trying to make you feel badly about yourself, but to admonish you like my beloved children. And everyone in the ancient world thought it was the father's chief role to admonish or discipline the children. So this is, makes perfect sense to them. Verse 15, for though you have countless guides, and that's the okay word, of, you don't have many fathers. I became your father in Christ Jesus through the gospel. He means I'm the first one that shared the gospel that started the church. I'm like your spiritual father in that sense. We might say spiritual mother, they birthed him. Verse 16, I urge you then, listen to daddy. Be imitators of me. If you ever listen to me ever, when I was your pastor at Corinth, please listen to me. Do it my way. Stop spending so much energy dividing on each other and who's got this and then and judging each other and complaining and backbiting. Knock it off. Imagine being the kind of people who didn't do that. They just emanated Paul and said, instead of a whole bunch of Christians trying to be in the front of the parade, we're all trying to get to the back. We're all trying to get to the place where we're not honored. Do it my way, Paul says. That's the way of Jesus. It's just the way of Jesus. Therefore, verse 17, I can't be there, Paul, saying, I wish I could be in front of you to show you how to live this way, but I can't. I'm going to send Timothy. He's my beloved and faithful child in the Lord, not literally his son, but a disciple of his. His number two, he's been discipling Timothy, to remind you of my ways in Christ as I teach them everywhere in every church. Verse 18, some at Corinth and different churches, they're arrogant, as though I were not coming to you. Some of you are like, bring it on, Paul, sucker, you ain't nothing. He ain't going to do nothing. Some of you are like that, Paul says. Some of you might be at Hill that way. Verse 19, he says, but I'm going to come to you soon, if the Lord wills, and I will find out not the talk of these arrogant people, but their power. I don't care about what they're saying. I care about the role of the Spirit in their lives. We'll see who really has the Spirit when I get there. We'll see. Talk is cheap. Verse 20, for the kingdom of God does not consist in talk, but in what? Power. What do you wish? Shall I come to you with a rod or with love and a spirit of gentleness? Now, he's hoping that they repent. He's hoping they change their ways. So by the time I see you, that's my hope. By the time I see you, it's going to be all different. As far as we know, Paul actually never made it to Corinth, but he did send Timothy. When I think about this last part here, as he's thinking about sending Timothy, it reminds me very much of the fact that these Christians at Corinth were baby Christians. I mean, these aren't, they've been around for a few years. They needed some example. They didn't need just teaching. They needed to see someone live it out. Uh, and I just stay on the father now just because you did. You know, I, I taught my son how to shave. There's things you just teach men things. And brush their teeth, whatever it might be. I teach them how to eat a steak like God intended. I, I'm kidding. Are you vegetarian? So there's good examples. So I, do you raise them up? You want to, I can say, now do it this way. I can tell them. But, of course, we all know it's easier to show them. And that's exactly what Paul's thinking. I wish I could show you in the flesh as I did when I was your pastor for 18 months at Corinth. But I can't be there right now. I'm going to send Timothy. Watch him because he does it the way I taught him. And I do it the way Jesus taught me. And that begs the question to me, if you ask the Corinthians, are you teachable? Let me ask you this way. Do you want Timothy to come or not? Are you ready for Timothy? Timothy's going to come. And he's going to tell you exactly how you ought to be doing it. I'm your father. I'm trying to tell you how to do it. Will you welcome him? Are you teachable? Are you teachable, Hill Church? Hmm. Who is that living example for you right now? Some of you don't have a living example for you right now. Maybe you're scared. Maybe you don't know enough people. I, I get it. Some people don't have a living example for Jesus for you right now. It's because you're not teachable. Because you've got to figure it out. That is, you don't avail yourself of the possibility that someone might be able to disciple you. And so you're just kind of you're just kind of puffed up like the Corinthians. If I send Timothy, will you listen? 
Are you ready for that? Or do you want to stay on spiritual milk like a little baby? Like I said in 1 Corinthians 3, you're little baby Christians. Which one? Do you want to grow up? If you're going to grow up, Timothy's going to help you out. Or the other thing I would think about is, are you a living example for someone else? Think of it this way. Would Paul send you on missions? That church is divided. They don't get, they're having a hard time. You've got to send Jeffrey. Jeffrey, go. You have got, he is the perfect example of how to live like Jesus. Would you be sent? Whoa, we got to get Brandon. Is he in town this week? We got to get Linda. Whoa, you got to send her. Would you make it to the top five? David, I don't know. I'm a humble. Good, I'm glad you're humble. You're more like Jesus. What I mean is think about that. Do you think you'd make it on anybody's list to be sent as a living example of the Jesus of Nazareth? No, David, I'm a dirty, rotten sinner. Well, if you're a Christian, you're not a dirty, rotten sinner. It's not the issue whether you're perfect. Is there anything about you at all that by someone being in your presence, you are modeling for them the lifestyle of Jesus? Is there anything about you? If there is, praise Jesus. <laughs> praise God. If there's not, maybe you ought to confess that to God. God, I want to be an example for you. Would Paul send me? Let's pray about that right now, in fact. Holy Spirit, we ask for your help on all these things, of course. We ask for your help not to trust our gut all the time, whether or not we think we're innocent or guilty, but we trust your teaching. So help us do that. Put into practice exactly what you say. And because we know we can be self-deluding, something might feel right that isn't right. So please help us be attuned, Spirit, to what you say, of course, but chiefly what you tell us through the text. Help us, Lord Jesus, as well, spend so much energy <laughs> as we can being a people who set an example. God, I just know already, I know in my own heart and mind, I bet there are other people right now listening to who think there's no way, I'm not perfect, I can't do it. Please, Holy Spirit, help us all let go of all those insecurities or maybe things evil might tell us. Please use us to be a model for you. And we need your help. Oh, my goodness, we can't do that on our own. We need your help to think, that what would it look like for us, Lord Jesus, in our own individual lives? We need your help to think about what it would look like to go to the end of the line of that parade, to be the kind of people who are never seeking the honor that the world is trying to give us. We're not trying to get ahead. We're at school, at home. We're not trying to be the people who are being popular or well-liked all the time by worldly standards. God, we need you. It seems something like an impossible task, but I'm so glad you said Jesus, but with you, all things are possible. So transform us, great physician. Take all the parts of us that get in the way of that and put it to death and raise us up on the inside spirit to do your great work. And to the glory of Jesus, we pray, of course. Amen. Amen.